we light the candle of joy. Before. Today we light the candle of joy. It is a small beacon of God's pleasure in his own self, his people and his creation. Before we light the candle, we read scripture together. Please follow in your Bibles. Today's Advent reading is from Jesus' fellowship and prayer with his disciples in John 16. So in your Bibles, it's John 16. We're going to be reading verses 20 to 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she has uh, n no longer uh, remembers her anguish. For the joy that a human being has been born into the world, so also you have sorrow now. But I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to, uh, to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. Before we light the candle, let's pray together. Let us pray. Lord, amid great darkness, pain, and despair, you return to your people through the coming of your Son invading with light, healing, and joy through Jesus. Forgive us when we forget that joy is your nature. Forgive us when we force a decision between sorrow and joy. Forgive us when we look lightly upon receiving and extending joy in your name. By your spirit, we break down the walls of our egos and idols that prevent us from doing so. Replace our lesser happiness with a higher pleasure in your truth, goodness, and beauty. By your spirit, bring us your joy, the ecstasy of our hope, the goal of our love, and the confidence of our peace. Father, for each of us and all of us, increase our understanding and help us to borrow on your joy until it becomes ours and theirs, those whom you have given to us. Amen. We now light the candle of joy. Amen, amen. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, well, we are in kind of the last week of uh, this series because we're in the final week of uh, our year together. Um, and the theme of this week uh, has, uh, is joy, and I'll get to that in a moment. But the theme of this series, the Advent series, has been uh, clarifying Christ through Advent. Because uh, I don't know about you, but we can, uh, even the best of us in this room, can kind of drift into this vague theism, this vague understanding of God. And we know what we mean, but in terms of our approach to God, our posture towards God, in our thinking of God, our responding to God, we can forget the fact that God has move the story along in such a way that he has chosen to reveal himself through his son. And so God has done the work of saying that I am God in Christ and let us not blur or forget that clarity that he has provided to us. And so that's what our theory, uh, that's what our, uh, the theme for this series has been is clarifying Christ. And so we've gone through each of the themes of Advent. We've gone through hope and we've gone through 
love, and we've gone through peace. And this week, we arrive at joy. And as I said during this morning's prayer, I really don't think the theme of this week has been joy. I feel like the theme of this week has been irony. Because it's been ironic what kind of the experience I've heard from um, my friends, family, loved ones, and then our own families, what that has felt like. And in many ways, it has felt far from joyful. But it didn't start off that way necessarily. Uh, this Wednesday, we, uh, Ann and I, had the pleasure of going to the, kind of the, the first uh, gathering in a while of the Franklin Interfaith Council where all the different houses of worship and their leaders came together, along with other community partners, to be able to um, speak about all things relevant and important in Franklin, in this space we're located in. And we've said that our vision eventually is to become a vital stakeholder in this region by virtue of how responsive we are in our citizenship, in our partnership, in our worship. And so we felt like, uh, we felt privileged to be invited to that table. And it was a wonderful table. And Dr. Karazi um, uh, um, moderated that session. And it, was, it wasn't fluffy at all. It got into some real things. And especially it kind of uh, converged in the recent Israel-Palestine conflict. Um, and the conflict isn't recent. It's just happening. But it's been happening for a long, long time. But we kind of converged that night in... Um, understanding as a community how to have that conversation and it really really filtered down to two people um uh, rabbi garfinkel did i say that right yeah. yep garfinkel um who's the local jewish rabbi and then a, a man who is on the on the board who has had a palestinian man who over the last few months has had 20 members of his family lost in the war um, and most recently four members of his family all at once uh, when a house collapsed so four generations in one fell swoop. And so talking about at a very real level, not at like a social media level or like a news bite level, but at a real human uh, level of what this conflict has looked like. And we just felt, and you know me, I'm not without opinions and I'm not without views, but I just felt humbled. And so the whole night I just was like, I, 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 when it was my time to talk and introduce our church, and I was just like, I was kind of like, thanks. Thanks for allowing us to be here. Thanks for allowing us to kind of eavesdrop on this conversation that we're Johnny-come-latelys to. Um, and so Ann and I both felt really, really blessed and humbled to be there and to even be considered for, like, next steps in that. Whether we take those next steps or not, just to be, again, given a seat at that table was, was an honor. And that was a moment of joy for us. And then it led to lesser moments throughout the week where... Um, difficulties landed in our family and you've heard about some of them this morning uh you've heard about uh some of the the not just how it landed in our family but other families here and i think that what that could cause during this season is the very opposite of joy and i think sometimes we think that the worst thing that can happen is sorrow and i don't want to i don't want to minimize that i don't want to minimize the the, the pain and the gravity that sorrow brings to our lives. But I think that there's sometimes something that's even uh, more crushing than sorrow, um, more joy-robbing than sorrow. Um, and it's something that uh, I tried to capture in this little text exchange that I had with my family. Uh, this was Thursday morning. And, you know, we have a pantry, and you know, generally I've been trying to, like, intermittent fast, but I'm a stress eater. Right? I don't know if you guys are. Some people, when they get stressed out, they stop eating. When I get stressed out, I eat everything. <laughs> Nothing is safe. Right? It's so much so, Anne has to hide things in the house so, so that protein doesn't go find them. I'm lying? No. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Um, and so I sent this message, and I said, hey, I'm stress eating. I apologize if the nut supply has gotten shockingly low. Nope, mine. Yeah, 6.50 a.m. <laughs> that was on my way out. The, yeah. Um, and I put, my next thing was going to be, I'll be better soon. And then this is what I sent about 10 seconds later. Same text. But I unsent this last line after sending it. Because I didn't want to commit myself to saying, I'll be better soon. Because I don't know. 
And so this is getting at what I think is probably uh, the greater threat to sustaining joy. Not necessarily sorrow, but what I call this foreboding joy. Where you might allow yourself to be happy or you might allow yourself a little bit of levity, but then you're going to pull it back because you don't know where this could land. I don't want to set myself up for failure by getting happy because the shoe might drop. And I don't want to feel like a fool. And so what I want us to do, and really what I want us to hear, is Jesus' words and, and encouragement that he is providing us a way beyond not just sorrow in some sense, and maybe not even sorrow, but I think he wants us to provide us a way beyond foreboding joy. And I think he wants to provide us a way beyond foreboding joy by redefining joy in light of Jesus' presence and his absence. I'm going to say that again. I think the call he has is not a promise that sorrow will not visit, but a push to say that there's a promise that you can go beyond this foreboding experience of joy by redefining joy, capital J joy, in light of Jesus' presence and his absence. So let's go to the Lord before we go to his word. William, would you pray for us? Amen, amen, and amen. Well, we're going to be in John chapter 16, and let me lay a little bit of context before we get into the text. So this is John 16, which is located between John 14 and 17, which is known as, uh, in many ways, the, uh, the farewell discourse, right? I know we're in Advent season, and in Advent season, you're supposed to talk about arrival, um, but today, I want to locate us in this kind of impending sense of departure, and that that's where our joy is going to come from. Not necessarily thinking just about Jesus' arrival, but Jesus' departure. So we're going to be in John chapter 16, starting in verse 20, where Jesus says, Truly, truly, if you have an older version, verily, verily, uh, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You'll be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. I think Karen said that not even a couple of minutes ago. And so I think at the beginning, the question here is, uh, how do we experience joy? What, what brings us joy? What are the catalysts or the triggers? You know, to, it's popular to talk about, I'm triggered. I'm triggered in this way. I'm triggered in that way. And we rarely talk about being triggered unto joy. But, but what are the triggers for our joy? How do we experience it? Where does it come from? Maybe it comes from, you know, someone sitting to your right or your left right now. Uh, maybe it comes from... Uh, a relationship, maybe it comes from an experience, uh, maybe it comes from, you know, your favorite sports team winding up on the right side of the ledger. We have different kinds of joys, and so how do you experience it? And I think that underneath the question of how we experience it is the question of uh, how do we understand joy, and even below that, how do we define it? How do we define joy? Is it something that's sustained? Is it something that stays with us? Um, is it something that's momentary? It comes and then it goes away. It may come back later, but it may go away later. And so it's kind of not sustained, it's more fleeting. And, and maybe it's ecstatic or hedonistic. Right? It comes through pleasure, experienced through various things. Maybe it's circumstantial, maybe it's transactional, maybe joy is something that is the product of, of um, your life circumstances and situations looking just so and meeting all of our expectations. Maybe it's the product of being, uh, uh, if I could be really cynical about it, maybe joy is transactional. It's the product of, of uh, you being well compensated, meaning God has paid you to be joyful by setting up your life just so. And so in return, Lord, I will be joyful. I will be joyful unto you as long as this, this, this is in place. 
And so at the, at the front end, I think what Jesus is going to do is engage not just our experience, but our understanding, our definitions of joy. And to be able to do that, to be able to do that, I want to access someone who, who has done some real thinking about joy, a famous uh, Christian thought leader, someone, not someone I honestly uh, quote from quite a bit, but at this point, I think it would be appropriate to go to uh, the words of C.S. Lewis, uh, especially in his book, Surprised by Joy, where he says something as only C.S. Lewis could say it. Um, so I want us to look at this passage from Surprised by Joy, and I'll read it. And I want you to see how nuanced it is and how many tensions there are in what he calls joy with a capital J. I call it joy, which is here a a technical term. Sharply distinguished, both from happiness and from pleasure. Okay, so whatever joy is, it's, it's not happiness, it's not pleasure. Okay, so already it may be pushing against our definitions. Joy has indeed one characteristic and one only In common with them, anyone who has experienced it will want it again. And this is the, the shocking part. This is the part we don't think about. It might almost equally well be called a particular kind of unhappiness or grief. Right? That's not a typo. Joy, in the way that Lewis is talking about it, might actually be not... Not opposed to, but in some ways in sync with a particular kind, a special kind, a particular species of unhappiness or grief. But then again, it's the kind of unhappiness or grief that we want. So, so just in reading this, you might be thinking, okay, he's talking about something that we, that, that's not what I'm talking about when I think of joy. So it's already pushing against our definitions a little bit. It's forcing us to rethink and reimagine what joy means. But that's C.S. Lewis, and ultimately our authority isn't under the words of C.S. Lewis. It's under the words of Scripture, and here it's under the words of Jesus. But, but let's engage this thing that, that joy is a partic- could be acquainted with a particular kind of unhappiness or grief, but then again, it's the kind we want. What does he mean, uh, an unhappiness or a grief, the kind we want? For right now, let me just say that one of the things that Lewis, and then I think more importantly than Lewis, Jesus, wants us to understand is that joy and sorrow, they're partners. And in some sense, you can't have one without the other. I think Karen actually said that before. The pain has to come first and then the joy. You can't have one without the other. So how are we supposed to understand that? Is there an illustration? Is there a metaphor? Can you, can you unpack that a little bit, Jesus? And now Jesus goes to unpack it in verses 21 uh, and following. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered uh, the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Now let me say this. I think Jesus is a masterful storyteller. I think he is a wonderful illustrator. And I say this without, hopefully, uh, without a shred of irreverence, I wish this wasn't the illustration he gave. I say that not only because, like, I'm a man, but I'm thinking Jesus in the room that he's in, um, it was common, uh, or I should say it wasn't uncommon for there to be casualties of birth in that time. And it's not in our day as well. And so I don't, want, I don't want us to hear Jesus glibly, and I don't want to put this up glibly because I know what the experience, I don't know personally, but I know that there are experiences where this is not the most comfortable illustration and an analogy to hear to unpack what it means to hold sorrow and joy together. So I say that as a disclaimer, and so what I say beyond that is, uh, Consider what it might look like for sorrow to turn into joy for you, right? Because in some sense, we've all dealt with uh, loss. We've we've lost friends. Um, We've lost family members. Uh, We've lost communities. We've lost careers. We've lost opportunities. 
uh, we've lost health, we've lost wealth, we've lost wellness. So there's, there's loss in all of these places. And so is Jesus just saying kind of like, well, you know, time heals all wounds, and so you've got to go through the, the valley in order to get to the mountaintop. And maybe, maybe he's saying something like that. But I think this illustration, this helpful illustration in some ways, but an unfortunate illustration in other ways, what I think it's getting at is um, an experience in which the sorrow and the joy come from the same object. Because that's what he's saying here. He's saying the pain in this illustration and the joy both have to do with the, the birth. And so the way that I can kind of just widen this out a little bit of, of this experience of sorrow, this experience of joy from the same object is to kind of talk about an experience that I've had with Anne recently. Um, I've not always been this person where, like, um, some people, uh, I don't know if you watch sitcoms, and it's like, you know, husbands and wives, they jump out of bed, and they're just like, I don't know if it's a Ken and Barbie kind of, like, relationship, but I've just been, and I was raised by a man who, who loves his wife, like, my dad loves his mom, I've heard him say it twice, um, in, 40, in 46 years, I've heard him say it twice, and that's when people asked him, do you love, do you love Nellie? Yes. Um, so, so my dad loves my wife, I'm sure of that. Uh, not my wife. My dad loves his wife, my mom. <laughs> he probably loves you too. <laughs> um, I love my wife as well, but we've had a new experience over the last couple of months, and it's been this, and it's really, really weird for me. Um, but it's a welcome weird, where in the mornings when I leave... I ache. It's very, very new to me. I ache because I don't want to leave. I really just, I want to be wherever she is. I want to enjoy the day with her. Um, I want to make up for lost time. I want to know her more. Uh, I want her to know me more. I want to talk with her more. I want her to talk with me more. Right? Again, making up for lost time. And, and, and it's usually, you know, right around 9 a.m., I start to, like, really feel the longing because I'm about to, like, have my first class in Newark. Um, for those of you who don't know, I, I teach at an inner-city high school, and so there's a certain level of stress that goes with that. And so as the stress picks up, I'm, I start looking at my find my location to see where Anne is, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm connecting with her there just by knowing where she is. And, oh, she looks like she's running again. Um, up and down Kingsbury Drive, and then right around 1.30, when I teach my last class, the same thing that has brought this ache for the first six hours of the day now starts to relieve. And it starts to let go into this sense of anticipation. Because the same object, and I'm sorry to call you an object, sweetie, but the same being, maybe that's the better word, the same being uh, that that distance from that being caused an ache, now, as there's greater proximity to that being, there's this level of anticipation that comes in. And so it's distance and proximity to the same thing uh, in, that Jesus is talking about here. Jesus is talking about it in terms of the birthing of a child. I'm talking about it as it relates to relating to my wife. And what Jesus is saying in both of these things is that joy and sorrow uh, are partners, and they're actually characters that interact in the story that God's writing for us. They're not mutually exclusive or opposed, and they're not static. They actually are dynamic. They're transformative. One can actually turn into another, right? It, it doesn't say sorrow will lead to joy. It says sorrow will turn into joy. And so it's, 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 if sorrow turns into joy, if ache turns into anticipation, then you can't have the anticipation and you can't have the joy without the sorrow and the ache that comes first. It's the prerequisite. And so joy and sorrow are not mutually exclusive and they're not opposed. They're not static and they just stay wherever they are. They're dynamic and they're not aimless. They're oriented towards a direction. They're moving towards a goal. And what's the goal they're moving towards? Look at verse 22, where Jesus is talking to his disciples. So also you have sorrow now, but, and here's where it changes, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. 
You have sorrow now. Why do his disciples have sorrow now? Because they're realizing that their distance from Jesus is about to grow. Right? This is the farewell discourse. Jesus is about to leave. And as far as their understanding will allow them right now, he's about to leave because he's about to go get arrested. And he's about to go get uh, crucified. He's about to go get all of that. So whatever proximity they've had, whatever intimacy they've had, whatever knowing and knowing known by him and with him they've had is about to increase. And so their sorrow is growing. But his promise to them is, I will see you again. I will be present with you. I will see you again, and then your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take that joy from you. And that's what we want. It's not just an experience of joy. We want an experience of joy that no one can take from us. It doesn't mean that it will always stay in the same degree, but it means it won't be fleeting. It means it won't be given to you by someone or something. Bless you, sweetie. Um, it, it means it won't be given by someone or something that will also casually take it away from you. It doesn't mean that you will feel uh, joy and acceptance and inclusion and connection and you will feel seen at this moment, but then a couple days or a couple weeks later, they might take it away from you. His promise is you'll have sorrow now. In fact, you need to have sorrow now because that sorrow needs to turn into something. It needs to turn into joy. And if the sorrow isn't there, the joy won't come. And when I see you again, your hearts will rejoice because the fuel for that joy will come from the sorrow. And when it does, no one will take away your joy from you. Isn't that what we want? And you might say, no, nah, I want the absence of sorrow. That would be great. Maybe, maybe. But I want to be able to, I want to be able to, to have joy without the fear of that. I want to be able to be happy without having to pull the string back from the happiness because you never know what might happen. I want to be freed up to be joyful. And so what Jesus is saying, what he's holding out to us, oop, what he's holding out to us is this promise that you do not have to settle for. In fact, you can move beyond this foreboding sense of joy, this joy that's always threatened somehow. How do we do that? How do we do that? And this is where uh, he's bringing us to a close in verse 23. We do that by redefining joy, which he's already pushing us towards, but redefining joy in light of Jesus' presence and his absence. What do I mean by that? Let's look. Verse 23, he says, In that day you will ask nothing of me. What day? It's the day in which uh, your hearts will rejoice when you see Jesus again in verse 22. But in verse 23, in that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. And so if the first thing that we wanted was that uh, our, our joy to not be able to be taken away, the second thing we want is that our joy would be full. It would be increasing. It would not be uh, shriveled up and impoverished. It would be weighty. How does that happen? He says a lot of things here, and as is his custom, sometimes those things are weird. And so what I want us to do is look at Jesus' time marker here. Look at how he says in verse 23, in that day, and then in verse 24, until now. What he's doing is he's locating this, this access to joy in a time period that comes after and before the resurrection. Okay, so, so the resurrection has something to do with our access and experience of joy, this particular kind of capital J joy. So in that day, you will ask nothing of me. Uh, until now, you have asked nothing in my name. What does all this stuff mean? What are these shifts that Jesus is talking about? How, they, how do they relate to joy? Well, hang with me right here. Before the resurrection... Jesus is, during the period of Jesus' arrival, during the period of his advent when he was here, Jesus did all the asking of God. Jesus is the one that petitioned God. Jesus is the one that sought God. So they didn't have to ask anything in Jesus' name because Jesus was there to ask in his name. And by the way, in his name doesn't mean you add the phrase in Jesus' name. In my name means according to my character, according to my nature. And so before the resurrection, they didn't need to 
pray and ask anything according to Jesus' character and nature because Jesus himself was there, embodied character and nature. So before the resurrection, they didn't have to ask anything in his name. Now, in that day, when Jesus rises from the dead, and especially when he departs to go be with his father, uh, they will not ask anything of Jesus. But what, verse 23, you'll ask nothing of me, but I say to you, whatever you ask of the father in my name. So now all of a sudden, after the resurrection, if before the resurrection, they're not asking anything in Jesus' name because he's there, after the resurrection, they're asking only in his name because he's not there. What this means is something has happened. And what has happened? Something has happened. <laughs> but what has happened here? If you're not getting what's happened here is we in some weird and yet wonderful way, have stepped into the identity and mission of Jesus after and by virtue of his resurrection. We have stepped into the identity and mission of, why I say this, the most joyful person that there ever was. And certainly he's not a person whose life was, was uh, uh, absent of sorrow. In fact, he's called man of sorrows. And yet he is a man of of ultimate and, and the epitome of joy. And so the joy that we have comes through Jesus' presence and his absence before the... Now we are, we are the people that are after the resurrection. No longer is it before the resurrection. We're after the resurrection. And so we get the joy of approaching God and asking God and, 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 and expressing and embodying who God is in the character, in the identity, and in the role of Jesus. And that's actually where our joy comes from. We ask and we approach God in others in Jesus' name according to his character because Jesus has bestowed his identity and mission to us that our joy might be full. And so my joy, as much as my joy is bubbles up in proximity to Anne at the end of the day, what Jesus is saying is, uh, your joy is going to be fulfilled in your proximity to Jesus on this side of the resurrection, in which Jesus is absent in the body, but he's present in his spirit. We have occupied his role, and as we grow in our understanding of what it means for us to identify with Jesus' character and nature and mission, our experience of joy will grow. Our experience of non-foreboding joy will grow. Because we will encounter sorrow. We will encounter suffering. We, we will encounter challenge and struggle in this life. But remember, all of those are ingredients to the kind of joy that Lewis wrote about and that Jesus is talking about here. Insofar as we step into the role of Jesus. But if we don't want to step into the role of Jesus, if we just want to settle for uh, the fleeting, the ecstatic the circumstantial joys of this world, we are actually keeping ourselves from the kind of capital J joy that Jesus is talking about. And we'll have to settle for just, at best, that sense of foreboding joy. And so I know I've said a lot here, and before we go to the table, I want to give you guys a chance to kind of unpack this and clarify this. So um, the mic should be going around. Someone has it. Someone has it. If you guys have a question, if you need clarification, if you want to provide clarification, uh, if you want me to elaborate on something, if you want to elaborate and expound on something, um, raise your hand. Roger will bring you the mic um, before we go to the table. <coughs> I love that we have a couple of external processors in this room because we're an internally processing church. And so without those external processors, all of those times could just be dead, there's, um, which is fine. There's yeah. a couple of things. Yeah. Um, so the first one is <laughs> maybe it's your job that you're having sorrow going to. <laughs> mm. Just a thought, though. <laughs> As you leave the house, cool. like, oh, it's the end of the day. <laughs> and, okay, now I'm going home. Just a thought. Um, the other thing was um, 
the word sorrow, so when I think of childbirth, mm. sorrow wasn't one of the words. Is there another word or like is there a some other like pain? Pain. Right? Pain. Yeah. So stress. Would, yeah. would you think that those words are interchangeable in this context also mm -hmm. of like pain and sorrow? Because I wasn't yeah. sad necessarily. Yeah. I'd say pain, distress, anguish. Yeah, all of those are interchangeable here. Yeah. Okay, so I have Be more gentle. What was that? Be gentle. No, it, it's more of a comment. Um, uh oh. Lately, I've been trying to, I would say, avoid being happy. And I know people are probably thinking, like, why would you avoid being happy? Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking more for joy because I feel like happiness is like an external thing that comes and goes, whereas joy is always there and, and, and you just tap into it, whereas happy is like it's dependent on circumstance, mm -hmm. if I'm getting that right. What is that last thing you said? Happiness is on circumstance, like, and it's usually like external mm -hmm. circumstances. Are you asking if that's a, a, that categorization is fair? Right. Yeah, I think, I think it's fair. I mean, depends, uh, our culture, definitions change with, with culture, right? Like, Happiness used to be this really robust word. Like back in the day, Christians wrote about happiness a lot. Like one of the greatest kind of American theologians, a guy named Jonathan Edwards, wrote a lot about the happiness of God and Christian happiness. And so, but I think in today's understanding of happiness, it does come from circumstance. Um, it's not this capital J joy that Lewis is talking about, and more importantly, Jesus is talking about, that comes in some sense despite the circumstances, right? where he says it could be called a kind of unhappiness, right? So there's clearly the happiness that comes from circumstances and the joy that Jesus is holding on to us are not interchangeable. They might look similar on the outside sometimes, but the, the driving force of it is, is very, very different. And what I think Jesus is arguing is we're not looking for a happiness that comes from the outside and circumstances. Jesus is holding out to us a joy that comes from, in some sense, replacing him because of him, replacing him in this world and stepping into his experience of this world, which certainly had circumstantial unhappiness, but then this foundational, weighty, robust joy. Yeah. TP. Yeah, I think I'd put an if in between there. We, we don't have to fear. And listen, I don't want to be like uh, someone who's out of touch with our experiences in life. Like, I'm scared to death of sorrow, to be quite frank. Um, and I think we all should be in some sense. But we don't have to be scared for sorrow because sorrow doesn't exist for itself. God is using sorrow to conform us into the identity and mission of Jesus. And insofar as we're willing to step into that role, sorrow is not a thing to be feared. It's a thing to be transformed into this experience of joy that Jesus is talking about. Yeah, great question. It's all right, you project well, Ming, here. your joy mm -hmm. from you. Mm -hmm. So uh, so in your sermon you're saying, okay, the real joy is that we can ask in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. we, we are now adapting to his identity, mm -hmm. his mm -hmm. um, character, so mm -hmm. we don't, we have access to the Father, so we have no fear. Um, here it says, so I will see you again. So is it the same is he meaning the same, like, wh where, where is he seeing us again? Is this, like, 
or the future or oh i see what you're saying yeah, yeah. is this like the near seeing again at the resurrection or is he talking more like second coming yeah that's a great question uh i think um i think he's talking about um within the context of john i think he's talking about the resurrection and then the ascension um you will see me again at the, like you're scared of losing me and you're gonna lose me um but you're also gonna get me back um but I think the you will see me again is actually the near term because where he's trying to get them to in John 14, 15, 16, 17 and follows is he's trying to prepare them for what's to come, which is the giving of the spirit. Um, and so he's trying to prepare them to take over in his name. And I don't mean conquer in his name. I mean, step into his role, uh, step into his nature. And in order to do that, he's trying to prepare them to take his spirit. And so the, in that day, you will see me again, I think he's talking about on the resurrection as I empower you at Pentecost and you step into my role, that's where your joy will be full. That's where no one will be able to take your joy again. So I think it probably applies to the ultimate sense in which we will see him again at the second advent. But I think in the immediate sense, he's talking about the resurrection. We have time for probably, oh, you have follow up? No. Yeah, yeah, theologians talk about already, not yet, right? Like, because Jesus has come once, we already have an experience of the kingdom and all that it brings, joy, peace, hope, love. But we don't quite, in the fullest sense, we not yet have a fullest, ultimate sense of those things because he will one day bring the kingdom in full. We have it in part and it increases on the way to having it full, but we don't have that full yet. So I don't want to make it seem like by virtue of the resurrection and Pentecost where we're given the spirit that we have the same exact access and experience that we will have in the kingdom in full. No, there will be a difference. Um, but that's not to say that what we have now is some shriveled up little promise of hope, love, peace, and joy. It's big. It will be bigger. All right. We got time for one more um, before Howie does the cut to me. Yeah. Is it a feeling? I'm not looking at you hard because this is a great question. Um, this is one of those once in a while. I'm like, does anyone else have, have a response? Um, It makes a lot of sense, sweetie. So we did last week on that question. We did? Uh, Yeah, and the, real, the, the, the stamp I'd put on that is the realization you have when you have those sorrowful circumstances of loss 
uh, of loss of um, friends and family and communities and careers and opportunities and health and wellness, the realization is some sense I have an experience right now that marked the experience of my Savior who lost all of those things, right? And when you can say, like, because we all want to be like Jesus, right? We all want to be like Jesus, and we think that that means be morally like him, like ethically like him, care about the things we care about. Yes, it also means that we can be experientially like him. And so we can, ex when we experience the loss and the abandonment from friends, we're having an experience that Jesus had. When we're feeling an experience that, Lord, I can go this far. I don't know if I can go any further. We have a Gethsemane experience that Jesus had. And so in that way, we also get to be like Jesus by having not only his ethics, or not only his mission, but also his experience of what it meant for him to be here. Does that make sense? So that's the realization is our sorrow is similar to Jesus's sorrow. And if that's the case, I've just given it eternal significance. And it is not purely circumstantial. It's actually an offering and sacrifice of praise that God is going to accept from us like he accepted it from him. Great, great question. Um, I'm going to lead us to the table right now. Um, and any other questions you have or things you want to say, uh, bring it up and say it here. Um, as we go to the table, we take the promises of Joy that Jesus extends to us, whether or not we have the week we want, whether or not we have the experience we want, whether or not we have the friends and the family and all the benefits of life that we want, um, we have at least at this table this enduring reminder that Jesus' presence brings us joy, but also his absence brings us joy, because his absence means that his spirit is with us. And so as we come to this table, we come and I come praying this, and maybe you come praying some version of this uh, yourselves. Father, I know that sometimes I settle for circumstantial happiness, like Marvin said. I know that in sometimes I would trade circumstantial happiness, getting the things I want, getting the position I want, getting the favor I want, getting the opportunity I want. I know that I would trade that for what you are offering me here. It's capital J joy. I know I would have and so I pray, Lord, you would forgive me for that, but don't just, don't just forgive me for that, Lord, because I don't want to keep making that same mistake. Um, give me the ability to choose differently. Give me the ability to, as um, Evelyn said, realize differently, to realize that the opportunity I want and the connection that I want and the community that I want and the validation I want is to have the experience that you had when you faced sorrow and were able to transform it into otherworldly joy. And so, Lord, give us your spirit to that end as we take of these elements that embody for us what climactic sorrow turned into joy looks like when the elements of the broken bread, bread symbolizing not just your death, but the injustice that came upon you, the abandonment that came upon you, the disloyalty that came upon you, the unfairness that came upon you, it symbolizes all of that loss. And then the poured out cup, Lord, does the same. But they also signal the entry into the new covenant, which you promised that those would not be the periods at the end of our sentence. But instead, Lord, they are ellipses that are signaling that something else is to come. And so would you please give us the best way of saying this, Lord, is resurrection joy when we come to this table and as we walk away from this table as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come when you're ready.